have a bunch of businesses. Um, Walmart is one in particular. Um, most recently, there's a video by um, um, I don't remember his name, but he got he got made in his company for because it was revealed that he was concealed carrying in a sort of a don't ask, don't tell if I can be so bold kind of a fashion. It seems to me that with regards to the fact that these are constitutionally protected rights and that we have a precedent that says the government shouldn't mess with these things. And if the purpose of government, and if the purpose of government is to protect people's rights, it doesn't make sense then that we don't have some sort of protection uh, against people being wrongfully discriminated against uh, for their firearm ownership or carrying status. It's a it's a serious um, it's a serious civil infraction um, with regards to how our individual rights and liberties are concerned at best. Uh, at worst, this, uh, uh, this I think is an attack on a very fundamental level on what we can and can't do and should and shouldn't do. Uh, right. I don't know is, if I need to say this, but I'll, I'll concede my time over to Walt for a response. <laughs> uh, sure, yeah. So um, I, I have one simple reductio for this that I'd like to get things started with. And, and I'm just going to present kind of an analogous situation here, right? So we, uh, we, we can have probably most people in the chat agree, regardless of the controversial feelings that there are about firearms, that say everybody here has a right to free speech, free expression. So all I want is to to reframe the argument for something that, that doesn't seem as lethal as a firearm, doesn't seem to, to have all the negative consequences tied to it um, as firearms use has in our culture, uh, in our minds here. I want to divorce that aspect so that it's it's much less scary. And it's just words and it's just people expressing how they feel, which they have a right to. And then I want to say that um, as far as the discrimination or carry of fire, uh, the discrimination pertaining to carry of firearms or the discrimination of um, owning and possessing the firearm in the workplace, um, I, I just want to say this is akin to me wanting to bring in a protest sign into my workplace on, say, abortion. And I want to protest um, abortion or uh, uh, I want to protest uh, anti-abortion uh, rhetoric or speech that I've heard. And so I'm just going to stand up in my cubicle in the office and begin chanting um, for hours on end. Um, the business here, if they fire me, if they kick me out of the business, if they trespass me, it seems like they're infringing on my right in your view with this argument. It seems like this type of thing, uh, you know, me me just standing up and, and screaming um, about women's rights and uh, the rights of or the rights of the unborn or whatever. It seems like uh, now when the business does something to remove me from that workplace, I've been discriminated against on the grounds of me practicing a right that I have, which is my right to free speech. Um, and, and it seems it seems to me that you disagree with this. So I would just ask you if as a manager, would you fire an employee for uh, loudly, you know, shouting from in the, from their cubicle in the call center, uh, their abortion positions for the rest of the class to hear. Uh, it, it seems like this just isn't the time or place for this thing. And so my vote is, yeah, you as a manager are absolutely justified in firing that person. You as the business owner absolutely would be justified in removing that person from your office. Why? Because you have particular interests there. Uh, this person's creating a hostile environment. Uh, it, it's not what we're looking for out of that employee. Uh, it's not what they're there to do. Uh, they can do what they want on their own time, but while they're on the business grounds, on the property, uh, they have to conduct themselves in a certain way. And that includes certain things that they can't bring into the business. It includes things that uh, they can't do in the business. And it kind of just comes down to that. So so I'm I'm curious as to your answer, you know, if, if an employee began a loud political demonstration inside the I think it's a very apt thing for you to mention that, and uh, I think I think rather than I think rather than um, explaining explaining to you why it is oh why it would be the case to why it would be the case that it shouldn't be because that that would make the position consistent but obviously this does not seem sound to us I I think I'd be willing to say rather that the situations aren't necessarily analogous as a secondary point to um, as a direct rebuttal and in addition to that there are um i think you have a little bit of a dilemma as well with regards to how you want to 
all with regards to who is allowed to infringe on you. Um, if uh, give me just like the next couple seconds, I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, here's one of the reasons why I don't um, why I don't think it's an, uh, it's analogous. Um, sure. At the, um, I would say, one of the things that I would say is that when it when it comes to expressing free speech versus firearms, the reason why you can fire the guy for being like I don't know. Uh, uh, abortion is wrong. Abortion is right. His picket signing during work, right? The reason why you can say this is not is not necessarily because he does not have the is not because he doesn't have this right. He does have this right in the workplace. Um, but it would seem more apt. It would seem more apt than that he's he has the right, but he's not like X or like size. He he does he's like using he's he's going he's going it to a bit of a different level. I would say prima facie, than if somebody is just, you know, just in this case, concealed carrying. He's not doing anything. I think the better analogy would be if you're disassembling your Glock and showing everybody at work, you know, hey, take a look at my Glock, whatever. I think that's a bit more analogous to the person picket signing. Because in one situation, the guy, per the guy can't work. And in the other situation, the guy can work. Right? And... Um, while I think this argument would go into open carry as well, I think concealed carry is a bit better for this, and I and I would be totally. You said totally willing, and then you cut out. Um, be, I would because I would be totally willing to say that maybe you can't open carry because um, in a lot of cases I think there are ways that you can say that open carry is a kind of speech. And I think it's very much so the case. So if you want to say that you can't um, use your right to free speech in certain other ways, that's fair to say. Just like how you can't use your Second Amendment in certain ways to justify certain things. I don't think your, I don't think your reductio is analogous to the situation that you're trying to apply it in. Sure. What so yes. Yeah. Be what would be better is if, uh, is if you tried to justify why it's the case then. I think it would be better then to justify why why it's impossible for somebody to work in uh, when they have somebody's carrying a concealed firearm. Why is it impossible for that person to work? Or maybe how is it if somebody can or cannot work when using these things? Because in one situation they can work, in the other situation they can't. So it makes sure. sense to fire someone for not working. Sure. So yeah, so we can get into all that. So there, there's there's three different major points here. One is that the, the first thing you brought up is that is this kind of claim that this is a false analogy. Um, the, the second one is that I'm, I'm facing a dilemma I don't think you really got into too much. But and then the third one is uh, talking about who's allowed to infringe. Um, my bad. Uh, do you so, want, do so you mind if I, I go into the dilemma really quick? Um, uh, let's let's touch on that after I address the two other points. And then and right, then go we'll ahead. go from there. So so first off, in order for this to be a false analogy, it would have to meet a certain criteria, right? Which is that the things that are being compared are not at all alike. In this case, I'm comparing the use of one constitutional right in the workplace with another, right? And you're saying that the use of one constitutional right in the workplace is not similar to the use of another constitutional right in the workplace. You would need to substantiate why, like, that is. So, for instance, is free speech not a constitutional right or is... Uh, you know, carrying a firearm, not a constitutional right, right? And so you'd, you'd have to be able to articulate that more clearly. I don't think you're going to be able to do that. I don't think that, you know, just knowing you personally and, and your stance on the Second Amendment being very strong, not unlike mine, I don't think that you'd be willing to um, necessarily commit to that. So, so suffice to say, my position is it's not a false analogy to compare two constitutional rights to each other and look at why we enforce them in particular ways in the workplace. So, this brings us to an issue of the workplace itself and uh, things like a hostile work environment, 
are things like a disruptive work environment, right? And a hostile work environment, for those of you that are privy to HR law out there in the audience, is typically going to be where if someone presents something in work that makes it difficult for you to work, you have to avoid someone's cubicle. And it could be something as basic as some, you know, stimuli, um, right? So someone has a, uh, a liberal tears mug and you're a uh, proud, you know, uh, you're, you're proudly on the left in American politics, um, that makes you feel like you don't want to work there. So you start avoiding that person's cube because you always see that mug and you know that deep down they kind of hate your ideology and who you are as a person. Um, you're forced to kind of keep your politics out of the workplace uh, and, and you feel the psychological pressure. We have laws saying, no, they don't get to do that. HR gets to talk to them and say, no, you get to leave that mug at home, right? So um, in the case of a firearm being concealed on your person, um, sure, right? Like uh, you, you could conceal a firearm on your person in the workplace, um, but if people know that you're concealing, like in the in the anecdote you brought up in the beginning, where a guy is kind of talking to people about how he carries and what guns he owns, and people kind of know that he carries, and then they tell HR, and HR knows that that's against the policies of the company because when everyone at the workplace knows that you carry a gun and some of them aren't comfortable with it, um, that can be an issue. Or uh, the workplace has a particular um, has particular insurance policies that prevent them from having standard employees that are unlicensed. Uh, by security agencies carrying firearms, or the workplace has particular things that are hostile to people with fire, or that are that are hostile, um, in a sense, uh, are made hostile when a firearm's introduced. So, for instance, if you worked in a psychiatric ward and you were concealed carrying, uh, that may not be a good place. Or if you worked at Moms Demand Action, uh, some anti uh, some anti gun rights group, right, or some gun control advocacy group. Um, if you worked there and were, were bringing a firearm openly or concealed on your person, uh, that for, for many of the people they work with, the victims of gun violence and things like that, that could be a particularly psychologically uh, kind of uh, traumatic thing, right? Um, and, and so there's there's actual damages that could be done in this sense that could be uh, that are that our legal system would be happy to acknowledge and pay out for, uh, right? Um, and, and so those things are there. Um, we we can absolutely say that they're there. So you may say, well, the abortion example is loud, and I, I kind of want to make the gun example, quote unquote, louder too. But that's not really the point, right? Like you could have an anti-abortion calendar up in your cubicle, and that could still be subject to these same types of things that businesses do to keep the workplace as a place of business. Um, and, and there's a reason for that. They have the right to their business. They are paying employees for their time. The way that the law works is going to say that you as an employee uh, have to be doing the company thing on company time. So whatever your job description is, you have to satisfy that job description while you're on company time. That doesn't mean that you uh, get to violate our, our policies and things like that. But it also doesn't make it illegal for you to violate policies necessarily. Um, so for instance, it could be uh, against company policy for you to conceal carry at a workplace, but we need to make a distinction um, between you, uh, say, conceal carrying at a workplace uh, being against the law versus the business can fire you, right? Um, and, and those are two different things. So without getting off track there, um, uh, you wanted to talk about this this dilemma and infringement a bit more, um, and I'd like to dive into that. Sure. So then, I'll, um, I'll just do I'll just do one little uh, one little thing. The reason why I say it's different is because I, I think you're being purposefully obtuse on something, not to be so brash. But in one situation, is it possible for somebody to work when, in your example, somebody is somebody is going all like and abortion now and abortion now being really really loud or like playing extremely loud music or something i i would consider it like i would consider it the same like oh you know i have i um i have a calendar i have a calendar of the uh i have the calendar of my favorite catholic church in my uh in my cubicle right and we obviously know the catholic church's position on abortion and it's really you know extreme with regards to the political media so I would consider that, I would consider that like you can work while look, while you can work with the calendar in the room. You can work with the, with the gun anchor nib, right? So like I said, you know, that is a more apt analogy. I don't like, so. And then, yeah, yeah, let's spend, let's spend more time here. Um, If you can work while you have this thing, then I don't see why it should be like, and I'm glad that you, uh, that's, that's the whole thing. 
Uh, and I'll move on to the other objective later. Yeah, let's let's yeah let's stay here then. If there's still unresolved stuff on this on this being a false analogy, so I think that um, I'll, I'll let me throw up another example then, and we'll use a calendar example. Um, I have a calendar with let's say um, uh, let's say I have a job as a Catholic priest, right? Um, and I work I work around other Catholic priests and um, and things like that. And I have a calendar uh, pinned up in my office or my cubicle or my coworkers walk by and see, and it's it's just straight up gay porn. It's like it's like firefighters, you know, um, very erotic, whatever. Um, and that's just up there in the cubicle. And every Catholic nun and every Catholic priest that walks by, that's my coworker, has to see it. They can work, right? Why why would that prevent them from working, right? In your view, it seems like that that's not distracting it seems like it's not technically stopping them from work they could just avert their eyes but it doesn't seem to really be what the law is speaking to here the law seems to be speaking to something that um is a particular kind of offensive that doesn't really belong in that work environment right and so it seems like the workplace would be right to ask me to take that calendar down like so the catholic church if i was in their employ saying hey you can't have an erotic calendar of firefighters up in your cube uh, because it doesn't align with our values, because it's distracting to people. It seems like that's well within their right in, in just a very common sense kind of way, right? Is that something you disagree with? So I'm really glad that you, that you use that to bridge sort of into like this psychological area, I'm going to say in shorthand. So sure. I, I'm, if I can summarize, basically there, if I can summarize, you're basically saying that there are some things that are so psychological, even though like you can technically, I guess if you were robots, finishing um finish up your work do your thing and not get offended or whatever or if you're you know you, you can do that there, it's still wrong in some way so then um and it's based upon the psychological impact on the the employee with with regards to what makes it a hostile work environment let's say i was a vegan i'm i'm in college i'm i'm looking for a job and i'm a vegan i decided to take a job at arby's the site of meat the the site of meat the site of corpses disemboweled mangled corpses as you eat them and consume them is absolutely wretched to me and disgusting sure. and immoral and it makes me want to vomit right is it right for me to go tell arby's hey you know this you have the meats and it's absolutely immoral and disgusting i need i need hr to do something about this like you need to cover up those meats you need to <laughs> yeah. remove them from the um, serving tray yeah like, so there, there are certain things, right? So if you were to say, um, like, you know, you let's let's go ahead and go into this a bit more, because um, that was a question I had when I was about, you know, when I was in my early 20s and I was working for a law firm way back in the day, they were doing a sexual harassment training. And, you know, I just straight up asked. I was like, yeah, I asked one of the lawyers and, I, and my question was, hey, what would we do about, say, you know, Hooters, right? You have to, you're made to wear these sexualized garments if you're a woman and they, they seem to only hire women. Is there an issue with discrimination here? Is there an issue with like occupational hazards and things like that for a lot of these like kind of like sex industries, you know, strip joints, uh, those that film pornography, right? Pornographers, things like that. The answer is, well, you know, there, there are certain things that, yeah, you taking the occupation, you're you're consenting to, right? So there, if you're consenting to be an actress in a porno, right, you're consenting to doing sexual things with your body. So if you were this very, like, um, a very devout Christian that was against pornography, for example, why are you applying for that job, right? So if there's something like that, that that that's categorically different and there are different ways that our system deals with it then you going out of your way to introduce something uh that creates a hostile work environment right so um obviously if you know if we're going to have people that produce pornography they need to be okay with seeing sex they need to be okay being around sex um things like that um on the other hand I, uh, you know, when we're talking about you going to work your nine to five office job, uh, there is there's a difference between, you know, me playing Pornhub <laughs> next to you, <laughs> right, in the cubicle next to you with my audio turned all the way up uh, or, or, you know, playing it on a screen in the same office as you. Those are two categorically different things. Right. So so we do actually have, you know, procedures in place and laws in place to make sure that businesses are good to do things like that. And some of those laws are the same reason why it's OK for you to hire a male model for uh, to do uh, photo shoots and uh, things like that for male clothing items. If you were in the male fashion industry, as opposed to having to hire a female model 
uh, to take the pictures wearing uh, what you what you're selling as men's clothes. There's things like that that we do, and it's the same thing for churches as well. Like if a church doesn't want to hire an atheist pastor, right? There's certain things that are just common sense that that are protected here for for some basic kinds of discrimination that actually seem to serve the public benefit pretty well. They seem to serve the private interests fairly well, right? Um, it doesn't make sense to have a church hire an atheist pastor as an example. It just is not in the church's interest. Um, it doesn't align with their beliefs, and it doesn't align with the beliefs of the parish, right? So um, th that type of stuff is totally normal. And, and it seems to me that, you know, in the same the same kind of vein, uh, the, the private property rights of the business, them being able to say, this is what we allow in our property, and this is what we don't, to a reasonable degree, um, up to and including, hey, you know, we don't necessarily allow firearms here. You're fine in your off time to go shoot guns and do whatever you want. But here on our premises, no, you're not going to carry. Here on our premises, uh, uh, no, you're not going to have that big gun calendar up on the wall. You're not going to talk about abortion. Uh, you're not going to play Pornhub on your computer while everyone else is working. Those things seem like just common sense to me. Um, one of the examples that you brought up is actually kind of interesting. Um, you mentioned church, right? Oh, you don't have to hire and even though you know churches don't necessarily operate in the same way. I can understand the analogy, right? They wouldn't hire an atheist pastor. Sure. Right. So then you you'd you'd extend to say that, oh, churches by nature of their business, by you know, in your shorthand common sense, they would want to hire people that are, you know, of the faith. If I if I ask then why is it the case that um one of the biggest things about churches, um uh, historically speaking, and even to this day, is uh, music, right? Um, there's always musicians at every church. If if you don't believe me, uh, mm -hmm. there are some there are some historically black churches that that, that it's it's basically it's basically uh, very like musical and like really just like it's a really interesting experience. I can't put it into words, but some of you probably know what I'm talking about. Having said, why is it then that oh they can't go ahead and discriminate when let's say the church hires a um, a musician, right? Because these musicians can, they, they're varying wildly between different beliefs. Some are communists, some are atheists, some are, you know, Satanist. You know, also, it's, it's, they seem, it seems that they have to, you know, equally not discriminate when it goes here, but why not this situation? So, in my eyes, then, there's either two things, either mischaracterizing something, or it seems to be that this common sense thing isn't necessarily protected by law or by discrimination, but by virtue of the thing itself. It seems to be the case that not a lot of atheists want to work at a church. So, so then sure. coming from this, if I'm, let's let's presume that let's presume that I am, presume then I am correct in this case, right? If we go ahead and assume that, what, um, how can this not be extended to say for let's say the atheist church musician? How can this not be extended to go? Oh, the the concealed, the concealed carry, and when I say concealed carry, I also mean like, I also mean like um, in ways of, like true concealment is the term I will use, where you don't blab, you don't talk about it, like it's one of the things that you can legislate, not, you can hr -ly legislate to not say, just like how you can't say at work, you know, whether or not you um, love or hate, hate speech laws, you can't have somebody nickname be Nate Higgers, for instance, right? You can't have that. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So in that sort of scenario, in that sort of sense, why can it not be applied that, oh, you know, you're not blabbing, you're just concealed carrying, no one notices, no one cares. And if somebody, you know, does something unreasonable to figure it out or like, or like something accidental happens or whatever, why can't it just be like sweep it under the rug? It's dealt with. Don't worry about it because these situations and these solutions do exist. Why are these scenarios not the same? So between yeah. the atheist church position and the uh, concealed carrier. Sorry, forgot to clarify. Yeah. So so first off, one is like one is particularly dealing with like hiring practices, let's say, and in the concealed carry examples, we're dealing with more directly a behavior that occurred, right? So there's there's kind of two different things. Um, so let's say that you're that you're an atheist working for a church, uh, for instance, as like a janitor, right? Um, should they discriminate against you? Probably not. Now, I'm not an employment lawyer, but my, you know, my thinking is they're not teaching. 
Uh, they're not really customer facing or consumer facing. They're not there to talk about their values as an atheist janitor. They're there to clean. So like if that's what they're doing, then cool. Like if they have an atheist accountant, cool. Like who cares, right? Um, so should they be able to discriminate on those grounds? Probably not. Um, and, and that's one thing. But when it comes to these particular positions, i.e. like a pastor, right? Um, the pastor needing that that level of authentic belief in what they do. Um, yeah, it seems like it's okay to say, no, the, the, the pastor at the Christian church that we hire needs to be a Christian pastor. Otherwise, that's just not what we're looking for. It's okay for us to select talent. That's that's just, yeah, it's, it's categorically different. Um, in returning to the concealed carry thing, like we have to talk about an epistemic problem that you have now, right? Which is the business uh, discovers that someone concealed carry. Uh, right. They they discovered this and it violates uh, uh, an agreement um, like an SLA or whatever that they have uh, for, let's say, their insurance. And this would just be the average business. I don't need to invoke like the gun control advocate, you know, activist business or whatever else. Just like we're going to just talk about this for a second. Um, it violates their insurance policy with them not reporting that or immediately terminating you. Um, they are failing to report something to someone where they have a contractual obligation to report. So for them to turn the other cheek here or to turn or to look the other way, rather, um, they're effectively, you know, committing fraud, right? They're they're not holding up their end of a bargain. They're misrepresenting themselves, who they are, who their employees are. Um, and that seems to be an ethical issue, right? Unless you want fraudulent businesses out there or businesses that are deceptive. Uh, with the uh, contracts that they're that they're negotiating or, or operating under that they've agreed to, um, so so that's another major difference. When we turn to the more extreme examples, right? We have let's say a, a workplace like a prison yard, right? A maximum security prison, and you have a prison guard that introduces a firearm to a scenario where none was intended to be there, uh, right? And we look there. Uh, well, now that firearm has become a liability right now. It's in the possession of these prisoners uh, who can take it and use it against uh, the guards, uh, uh, create all kinds of havoc, uh, kill someone inside the prison cells, whatever. They can do all kinds of crazy stuff now that a firearm's been introduced into that very uh, contained environment with with individuals that most people agree shouldn't be using guns um, in that place. Right. Um so what like, we can just see that like this idea of like no discrimination leads to all of these absurdities and that it's perfectly reasonable that you, to discriminate. Well, uh, I think that you, uh, I don't, um, there's one thing I don't find um, compelling, but I'll save that for later. But the thing that you mentioned, government facility, like, you know, in a prison yard, right? Now, can, can we grant that, can we grant and can we agree between us two that it is that privatized prisons should not exist. Can we can we grant that really quick? I, um, I feel like that is something. I mean, I mean, I mean, sure, um, sure they they shouldn't, but that doesn't remove the the, the practical problem on the table, right? Yeah, it doesn't remove the fact that they it doesn't remove the fact that they do exist, right? And this is kind of where I'm gonna like expand on it a little bit back into the other part where it's not necessarily compelling regarding you know um, insurance, but. When we go, um, when you go into any federal facility, right, it is granted that, like, let's say, a full, let's say, uh, I don't know, a post office, right? It, it's clear, um, it's clear and obvious that on that, um, that there are specific, that there are specific prohibitions on the federal side, not necessarily the employment side, like on the federal side, not uh, like a, uh, what's the term, on the criminal rather than civil side, right? You can't. You can't have a gun on in the post office. You can't have a gun in court. You, have, you can't have a gun in the in the Capitol building or whatever, right? So the idea. So then the idea, if you grant private prisons, like oh, you know, if you grant that private prisons shouldn't exist, you can't really say that something that you can't really say that that uh, oh look, if you do this, then you'll allow guns in the prison yard because this is a this is because the because the this policy, hypothetically speaking, isn't the effect of guns in the prison yard, the private prison is not the cause of this policy the cause the actual cause of the fact that is the fact of its very own existence in a federal prison of course you wouldn't bring a firearm into the prison yard because you can't have a firearm on federal property right so there's that and the other thing that's also sure. the um insurance um presumably uh, there isn't is that would it make sense if we had this policy and said oh Insurance companies can 
violate this policy, right? No, this wouldn't make any sense at all. The the uh, the insurance companies would also have to do that, meaning that they can't discriminate on price, they can't discriminate on policy in um, regarding firearms in the workplace. They would just have to, you know, suck it up and deal with it like every other business that would be forced to suck it up and deal with it here, right? I think the more compelling points that you did bring bring up were, uh, um, and that one of them we were about to go on was uh, the dilemma, but the other, the things that I found a bit more compelling on my side where, um, where there's such a scenario like a, um, uh, what's it called? Like uh, occupational hazards, your uh, uh, occupational hazards thing. That, that was definitely more compelling than this. And what I'll say is that like, you do face a certain level. And I think it's actually a really good time to address that then. Because it seems we're taking very careful steps to make sure that in some situations, some of your liberties can be, um, can be stepped on and we just, say that they're not liberties in that scenario um it doesn't it doesn't seem then if you it doesn't seem where where are these lines and why are they anything but arbitrary and if they are arbitrary why do you have why is there uh just this distinction uh that why is this arbitrary thing more important than other arbitrary things if it's uh, arbitrary you know what about it right yeah um, sure why can some people fuck you up and not other people yeah, so so first off, I don't think that any of this is arbitrary at all from offset, right? So like you're arbitrarily introducing this right and saying that because the because the government has a, a certain obligation to the people, um, therefore the business shares the obligation of the government. And I don't see any motivation for that. Second, um there's this the there's this like, uh, so the government's obligations are are to prevent your rights from being trampled. It's not, it does, it's not just obligations in them of themselves. Um, you said something really apt a while ago um, to, with regarding IDs, say, saying something along the lines of, oh, criminals, sarcastically, by the way, criminals totally don't infringe on your rights, right? So yeah, the sure. government does have an interest in regulating businesses to make sure they don't, um, they, that they don't infringe on your rights, right? Laissez-faire capitalism, if left untreated, Will at will definitely end in lessened civil rights for everyone else. We can totally regulate the hell out of businesses so long as the point is of individual liberty. So let's so let's let's take a brief pause here. How does introducing this dilemma, which I see as a red herring, like so sure, maybe I do have a problem here that I do need to resolve with the specific location of government and <laughs> business and whose rights and everything, and I need to untangle that uh, broadly to, to have a, a cohesive ethical government structure in my worldview. Um, how is that remotely relevant to, to the debate at all, right? Like, I don't need to have that here today. Um, and, and I don't think that's something that you could provide with this account today, even if you tried. I don't think that you avoiding um, answering that, that fundamental practical question of, hey, look, you know, in a world where we have private prisons, in a world where we have psychiatry offices and we have uh, 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 psych wards and and things like that, uh, in a world where you can have a business where uh, you go around and work with gun violence victims uh, that that suffer psychological trauma at just the very sight of a firearm, why is it that in this world? Uh, it's not ethical for those businesses and those things dealing with that to say, hey, we're going to have some some reasonable restrictions here on if you're allowed to have a gun in the workplace in a particular way or at all, um, or if you're if you're going to produce that liability at all. Like, it doesn't answer that question. It's just deferring out to this other dilemma of, well, can you solve everything wrong with uh, political and and uh, political theory right. and, and theories okay. of government, that's that's a non-answer, right? The the fundamental question for you and the, the argument that we're not really seeing yet that I need to see is the argument for why businesses cannot discriminate at all against people who are uh, carrying firearms or practicing their Second Amendment rights in the workplace, right? Because we, we have to stay apropos to the prompt, right? We have to stay right. within the prop for the for the debate here. So, right. so that's my question yeah. for you is is how do we how do we actually meet that? Because I'm not I'm not seeing that argument from you yet, and I, it could be that okay, I'm confused, sure. but I just don't see. Yeah, it. I think yeah, um, I, I, yeah, I think so. So then let me go ahead and uh, 
let me let me uh, let me go ahead and uh, go back to that, right? So then, if we accept if we accept that it's given that government needs that government needs to protect your rights in if there's a situation where your where your rights are violated and the government does nothing, I, we would say that the government has failed its obligations. I think it's I think it's pretty you know I think it's pretty easy to say that if if uh, if the government fails its obligations, then the government um, in in the if the government failing obligations is unethical, right? If the government fails to protect you when it should have, it's unethical, and that's because breaking contracts is unethical. I think this is really easy to grant. So um, really easy to grant. And if you disagree with me, let me know. So then in that case, in that case, then, so we have a situation that where we have a bunch of businesses where we not a bunch of businesses where we have businesses that are able to go ahead and selectively say that on our property you can't do X Y Z. You can't, you can't do constitutional right A, constitutional right B, constitutional right C, right? You can't do these things, even though, um, and uh, even though in the vast majority of cases, and even in the minority of cases, you mentioned psych courts, right? We would say that people who are being involuntarily committed, they're not necessarily, they're not necessarily, uh, uh, I don't mean this in an ableist sort of manner, but they're not necessarily, uh, uh, moral agents in the same way that a comatose patient isn't necessarily a moral agent either, right? We 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 have to we have conservatorship of them, like the we have to make sure that we we have to make certain decisions for them. So then, in that case, then with the psych board, we wouldn't have that issue. But if we take the vast majority of cases, why are you? Why are? Why does it seem? Why is it the case that the government is allowed to make sure because of some? some really loose psychological horror thing that can't be covered by some kind of universal application of like occupational hazardry by nature of being i don't know i guess in america right there's there are certain occupational hazards for being in certain areas right i don't see why you can't just add Somebody may or may not be carrying a firearm concealed, and because it is their right to do as an op occupational hazard in um, whenever you're in America in general, right? So, like with the exception of federal buildings, courts, whatsoever. Well, I mean, I it's see... it's still an occupational hazard there too, right? Like just because like it's a federal agent carrying a firearm doesn't remove uh, the occupational hazard in that particular place that just you aren't able to carry that firearm right so like the firearm is always going to to have some level of risk associated with it right and we're never going to divorce that from firearms like firearms entail some level of risk just like driving a car or just like using a knife or anything else right and they like all these things entail living some some level of risk and they're they're all going to be included in living some... in california with forest fires sure yeah there's there's loads of occupational hazards and reskinning them and 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 describing them in different ways doesn't doesn't get rid of them um just because it just because the fire department does a controlled burn doesn't mean that there's not risks associated with that fire happening right you can still get burned by it um but we seem okay with these occupational hazards right the, the reason that we're okay with them is that certain actions have been taken to mitigate a lot of these things right in those instances um that doesn't mean that it's eth an ethical hazard or an unethical hazard it just means that's how we deal with risk Right. So I guess I guess I want to kind of tie this back because I'm still not I, I'm still not really seeing the argument here. And I, I think it may just be better to kind of prompt. I, I want to make my disagreement with the proposition more concrete for you. So I think right. that the prop is either vacuous in the sense that it's meaningless or it's incorrect. So and so my argument for that is as follows. Right. So if trespassing uh, someone for the practice of X behavior is not an infringement on their rights, then we're not really talking about anything at all here, right? So like like if a business can say, hey, you're fired, you're trespassed, don't come back here because you carried a gun in here and we don't want you to do that, right? But if we say that's not an infringement um, of that person's rights, then we're not talking about anything at all here, really. Like it seems like out of the spirit of the prop, in my opinion. So the the next section of that dilemma is the the opposite of that, right? So if trespassing for the practice of X behavior, i.e. carrying a firearm, is an infringement of that person's rights, then we're not allowing businesses uh, to really practice well, the property rights. Working, working at a business isn't trespassing. Well, but by getting fired, getting fired, uh, being told don't return to this business, right? Those, those, that would be 
uh, trespassing that individual, right? So like if we're saying that that's yeah, wrong for the business to do, well, so yeah. if we're saying that it's wrong for the business to do on those grounds, then the business can't really right. practice their property rights at all. So then there's an issue here, which is that if the property rights of the business can be infringed, so if property rights broadly can be infringed, then on what basis is the Second Amendment going to stand on? Because the Second Amendment is telling you that you have what? The right to keep and bear arms. You have the right to possess property. So if you're infringing a more fundamental right to property um, that the Second Amendment rests on, then you're undoing your own foundation here for the defense of the Second Amendment. You actually wind up undermining your own position. So then, so I, so so then I, I want to see, so I want to see your response to that. So then you've confronted my um, my dilemma to you with your dilemma to me. The dilemma being that, oh, there's no way I can enforce this ruling without uh, without infringing on property rights. Is this what is this what the uh, is this what the uh, okay? So then, um, in this case, in this case, then, um, are are you willing to say? Are you willing to say that we don't infringe on people's um, when we don't infringe on people's property rights? If you agree that intellectual property exists, because uh, I the first the first scenario, if you be, if you believe in the merits of intellectual property, somebody somebody's thoughts, words, whatever. If some um, if you think that no no hold on pause. Me, me why, why are we talking Let's, about intellectual property? So like, like we, we can just focus on the physical property of the business here, but, and the property of yeah, the firearm, sure. right? Yeah. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and focus there. Cause I, uh, I was somewhere else for a minute, but, um, uh, you're, you're asking me why, um, I think that there is a way that we can infringe that. Um, I don't think that property rights and, uh, why I don't think that property rights and individual rights per se are um, are always are always necessarily connected. I think at a some point in time, some point somewhere, there is a place where something has to give. And I think um, I think you see this a lot. I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna say oh Mark said this or whatever. But there there seems to be this distinction between more uh, liberal philosophies, more um, more socialist philosophies um, or political systems where they say, look, there are instances where property rights and personal rights go ahead and uh, conflict. That's why personally, I don't necessarily think that the Second Amendment is as much as a property right as it is an individual right. And I take very much care to di make a distinction between those. As a result- what, what does keep and bear mean then? What does keep and bear arms mean? Right, it's written that way, but I don't think that the right is that way it's just how somebody wrote it it's expressing it's ex, it's expressing a reality it's not the reality in and of itself right the reason why you have the ability to keep and bear arms or that the worker shall not have their uh um the worker shall not be deprived of their arms or ammunition or whatever the heck that quote was right the reason why we have this is because that right reflects reflects something endemic in in human nature in human nature, we want to make sure we are alive more often than not. We want to make sure that whatever tries to harm us, we can do something about it. So this entails like the right to the second, the right to keep and bear arms is not the fundamental right to it is not the is not property. The fundamental right to it is the right to self-defense. The right to self-defense come like that's the error that you're making. Just we own we own property, thus therefore Second Amendment doesn't make sense. We have a right to self-defense, thus, therefore, Second Amendment makes more sense than the latter. So it doesn't uh, make so this objection doesn't make sense. Well, it, it still makes sense, though. Right. And so the, the reason being is that the language used in the Second Amendment. So I agree with you on the basis of this being, uh, you know, if we look at if we look at what the, the founders said. Right. And they're like ne uh, necessary for the security of a free state. And there's multiple threats to security. You and I agree with it's not just the government. There's criminal elements. There's things like riots. Uh, a tornado can be a, a threat to the uh, the security of a free state. I don't know what a gun will do against a tornado, but cool, you know, like, you like know, all kinds of a, all kinds of threats uh, to to the security I, of a free state. Um, do you mind if I segue into something really quick? Can I? Can I? Let me yeah, let me ahead. finish this. Let right. me finish this point. So so sure, there's there's all these threats to the security of a free state, but but the context in which this is placed is a property context. So the right of the people to keep and bear means the right of the people to possess on their own these things. And if we don't believe that personal property is the context of the Constitution, uh, that the Constitution is referring to in the Bill of Rights and, and um, 
these things, that it's not a context that's applicable here, then I'm really curious as to what you believe the Fourth Amendment is about. Well, um, well, the way uh, I don't treat the I don't treat the Constitution, you know, I don't treat the Constitution in and of itself as some kind of a uh, as some kind of an you know ethical system. It works. It works functionally well enough as a as a substance for a government system. But I think it is a, I think it is a, you know, in, in Plato's, and if I were to, you know, try to make an allegory to an allegory, uh, this would be, this would, um, the constitution is basically man's way of trying to reflect the, the, you know, and this is get, getting way off the scope and this requires a different discussion altogether. But um, the way I would frame this is that the constitution reflects tries to reflect an ultimate reality, but fails in a lot of ways. And I think there's a lot of ways to, you can say that the Constitution is flawed in a couple of instances, right? It's not, it's not a perfect document. No document is. But I wanted to segue into something right here. Then. So then if, if you, um, I don't know if you can, I don't know if you've contested that the right of self-defense, the right of self-defense is something that's just is an individual natural right by the virtue of it, uh, by the virtue of, um, the fact that we naturally just don't want to fucking die, right? Why is it then that a, that a business, just because you're on those grounds, why can a business then say, hey, you know this natural right that we didn't give to you, the government didn't give to you, all these things, why is it then, why we now have the authority when you're standing on this particular piece of land that you cannot exercise a right that we didn't give to you so we can't take away from you? You cannot, you cannot carry a firearm here, basically. Um, so sure, like, it's, I, actually yeah. speaking, they can't violate that. <laughs> I can carry it there anyway, right? And it seems that there is, it seems that there's not a, the ability to discriminate on that on the case that we respect individual rights doesn't make any sense. If we respect individual rights, we wouldn't have done that. We wouldn't allow businesses to infringe so on individual rights. I, like I, I think you're conflating. I think you're conflating a natural right, which like I haven't even seeded that. I used to be with natural rights. I'm exploring fictionalism more now. Um, and I, I think right. fictionalism for rights is overwhelmingly more compelling than natural rights. Um, but I think that um, I, I think that like we, we can't conflate a physical capability with a natural right. Um, th those are very different things. Right. So oh, like, we, I, I, we, didn't, I didn't mean to confuse. I didn't mean it, to confuse it. Sound, it like it that, sounded right? to me but, like the, the very fact that you could walk into a business with a gun and that they wouldn't know means that you have a right to it. it that, yeah, that's the, I, I the wanted, proof of the that's the proof of the right, not the proof of not. That's the proof of the right, like of it, like naturally existing. Like, for example, I, I, I don't think know. that's I don't think that's a proof for that at all, though. Like, well, so like like, like a natural proof, right is not a natural. But that saying that that would be a proof of it at all would be to conflate the natural right with whatever your capabilities are. And, right. and this is so, simply incorrect according to like any social contract theorist out there. Yeah. Like so, that, sure, yeah, they'll, I, they'll I, grant, I, they'll happily grant eat or be eaten, right? Um right. is is just the natural the natural way to be. Like that's that's Hobbes, that's um, you know, that's uh, uh Locke, right? Like like people don't have an issue with that um in social right. contract world. But like why are why are we even basing this on um, the social contract definitions. It just seems like you're having to dive even deeper and deeper into a basis um, when social contract has its problems as it is. Instead of just answering, you know, the the question here, how do we deconflict this issue where we deprive businesses their property rights, but then you get to because have them for the context of the Second moral Amendment? Agents, so businesses don't have rights. They're not moral agents. They're not people. They don't so, have rights. So then why are we putting an onus on businesses or saying that businesses should act a certain way if they don't have duties? I'm not I'm not putting an onus. I'm not putting an well, onus you're saying on they're not, I'm putting you're, an onus on H I'm putting an onus on Jeffrey at HR who wants to who wants to get rid of the who um who wants to get rid of the guy that works th that works there that holds that holds that that holds that firearm. And the reason and Jeffrey doesn't have the right to say doesn't have the right to discriminate on that if we are basing, you know, in a non-discriminatory world. He doesn't, Jeffrey doesn't have the right to say, hey, look, we, you don't have the right to defend yourself using that weapon and you can't have it on here. It's basically saying this, it's saying the same thing. You can't have your right to self-defense in that particular way in this 50-foot radius. So either, so, so make a choice. That doesn't make sense. 
Let's return Why to the is- prop, though, right? It is necessary for in the U.S. to provide protection for the worker against workplaces, right? So why are right. you holding the workplace? So I, I interpret workplace as a business, not as a person in HR, right? So why why are you holding the workplace accountable here um, if they're not a moral agent? If they, well, if they don't have we've... some obligation or responsibility, it doesn't make sense to hold them accountable for something, right? Right. Right. I fail to see I fail to see why this is necessarily important because I think because I think we would say because like can Kmart get up and walk, you know, can Kmart do anything? Kmart is a place, it's an object, it's a store. We're talking about people, what people can do in institutions and how may they may exercise their power. That's really what the prompt that that's really what the what I was trying to like get at. That's really what I was trying to trying to get at, and I, you know, used a bit more colloquial language in doing so because I, uh, I couldn't formulate it in a way that wasn't fucking five paragraphs. So, sure. So you know. yeah. No, so okay. So so we can say that when we say the business has this obligation, that we just want to kind of tie make that more individual because we we want to just completely deny collectivism at all in any capacity for this. And so really what we're trying to say when we say workplace or business is those business leaders, those particular individuals that are in charge. Yeah, the people the okay. people that have power can't exercise this power in that way because it is unethical. So I think That's that- That's I think I should have framed it and I, how I wanted to frame it in, in yeah, an intention. Yeah, so I, I think that you can- I, I, I think that you can, you can get away with that and I'm fine with speaking in individualistic terms for this debate then it is an individual or group of individuals that owns the property who is no longer allowed the agency to control what is on their property or what isn't, right? Right. And it's not it's not something that is, um, let's say, it's not like, hey, look, my worker has blue eyes, so they're not allowed on the property anymore. It's not some like ad hoc thing or, um, oh, they're they're black, so they're not allowed on the property anymore, where it's like this clearly unethical discrimination like we haven't even seen that as the case yet established um they're just saying hey look you know i buy insurance from you know uh all state or aflac for my business and they have a no guns policy otherwise my rates go up they skyrocket and uh and that's just because of risk of having firearms in the workplace and the occupational hazard and the math that they do uh for my insurance rate and if i don't report it then uh, it's fraud. I'm committing fraud yeah, so and and I and I'm committing this deception. So like they're still in a pickle. Like you haven't absolved them of the ethical issues of uh withholding their contracts here. And what you're saying is that um with the practice of your rights, you're allowed to impose a financial burden upon them. Right? Because either either they violate a contract, so in which case you're imposing not just a financial but a legal burden, or uh they they're honest about your infringement and or your your impact on that contract um on that dealing that you had no right really to do that they told you hey don't do this if you're going to work with us the 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 basis in which your contractual arrangement with this business is worked out you violated because you didn't follow the policy and you brought the gun into the workplace you can't so like you um, you can't violate a contract if the term you can't violate a contract whose terms are like i guess in, in short, bullshit for a reason because I think we had this case in Germany where they somebody's like, I sign away my life because I want to get eaten. I'm totally fine and I consent to this, and we still charge the guy, right? Uh, I would the way this would be covered is if we apply the same if we apply the same system is like, no, these terms are fucking bunk. You can't agree to this contract. This contract is fraud, fraudulent from not fraudulent, but it's sure. stupid from the beginning. So bunk, whatever. Get let's fucked. take let's take the last ten minutes here, um, and just I really want you to demonstrate why that is the case here so like let's assume that you're correct let's assume that we uh we can't have you constructing these con or agreeing to a contract that is bunk that you think is bunk but that you agree to nonetheless that we're ignoring all those problems and we just want to focus on let's demonstrate why this is bunk okay um the reason the reason why is because uh um, what's the part- what's the particular term of like for Allstate? Hey, um, Allstate says you can't have this particular insurance policy if you're going to go ahead and um, have firearms cons- um, on the property. You know, if if you're not going to do anything about firearms, right? Um, that's the that's the policy, right? The reason why they 
the reason why the contract is bunk is because that policy is that policy is uh, um, is unenforceable because there's because they don't have the ability they don't have the ability any legitimate ability to say that you don't have a right to this. If you have a right to this, it doesn't matter what all the other people say. That's why I can go out in the street and uh, and uh, that's why I can go out in the street and you know hand out leaflets to anyone who wants to uh, grab them, like um, saying whatever the hell I want. It's the same thing here. The business can't just be like, well, shit, you know, I don't want you to have firearms here. They can't. Um, they can't necessarily do that. The reason why it's bunk is because they don't have the ability to functionally do anything about the terms. They don't have that power. They don't. They didn't grant you the ability to have firearms. If it was God making the contract, I guess you could do that. But it's not. It's all state. So that, that, that doesn't. Um, that doesn't make there's sense. No, to me. There's no way. There's no way for you to consent. There's no way for you to consent. Like there's no way for you to be like, hey, I totally agree to relinquish something that I never. That um, I never had the ability to grant or ungrant. It was just here. It was just eternally here. So I don't think that do do I don't that? think that the business I don't think that the business is trying to get you to relinquish your say your right to own firearms, right? Like they're not they're not out to get you on that. We're talking about like carrying firearms in the workplace in a very like practical, straightforward way. Um, and the business saying no to that, being like, no, you can like either keep it out in your truck. Or uh, park your vehicle um, away out of uh, uh, off of business grounds because we don't want firearms here. They're not saying you can't own a firearm or you can't carry it in your off time. They're saying when you're conducting yourself in this way and are here for business, you conduct yourself in a certain way. And if you want to do business with us, you agree. If you don't, then don't they, do it. But they, the, can, the, they can control how you conduct business, but that you but that's not one of the um, ways they can control how you conduct yourself. So so they're not asking you to stop being a human. Like I don't see that happening here. I don't see right. them. Um, I don't see them denying you um, a, a right to security at all, right? Like they're they're saying that like no, if you're going to engage in business with us, you simply have to conduct yourself in certain ways, right? Do you agree that there are certain ways that companies can tell that there are certain ways that a um, that a company? No, no. Do you agree that there are? things that a company cannot say to you like a company like if a company said you must conduct yourself in x way would you say that them saying that in some certain circumstances would be patently unethical like for instance for for instance let's say um let's say some let's say there's a let's say there's a black guy who um really likes bringing red beans and rice to work right and um he, he eats it on his lunch and then hr is like you know I really don't think you should conduct yourself that way. I want you to bring something else for lunch. Maybe hamburgers, pizza. Is, is, that, is that right? I think it's not. You, a business can't, can only tell you to conduct yourself in a way and manner that is reasonable. Yeah. So, right? so why is it unreasonable then? So like, we can grant yeah. that, sure. Why is, it, why is it unreasonable? Let's reframe okay. it that way. It's un it's unreasonable for a business to tell you to conduct yourself in a way that's that's telling you that you are not allowed to have firearms on your person on your property because this functionally this functionally just deprives you of the, um this function deprives you while you're working on the property to a right to your right to defend yourself using the best measures and means and tools available to you right I'm, I'm not, you have a I'm not, right I'm not that. certain that's the case. So I think that you do have a fundamental right to self-defense. Um, and I think that the business does, does agree, you know, businesses generally agree with policy wise and they'll say, okay, so you have a fundamental right to self-defense. Uh, we don't allow firearms here, but yeah, if, you know, if there's an active shooter or something like that, run, hide, fight, um, get out of there, do whatever you need to do to defend yourself. 100%. Okay. You're not going to get fired for that. So in this in this case, it's like, OK, then we're not really talking about anything like the business is still fine with you doing that. They're, they're just saying this particular manner uh, that, that you're desiring to do this is unreasonable, given all of these other real world restrictions that are impacting us. Right. So in we're this, making a judgment call. Per, and not every business has these manner. policies, by the way. So you can go yeah. work someplace else that that doesn't have these. And it seems okay, well, if that's just what is quote-unquote reasonable in, in your subjective opinion, you can just go find a workplace and, and do that, no problem. Like, so, then, so then would it be reasonable then for, uh, for a government to say, hey, you know, your right to free speech, you can't exercise that in this way. You can't, uh, 
um, you, I, I don't, um, you can't express your uh, right to self-expression by wearing a Hawaiian shirt. No, 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 not, not even that. By uh, wearing a, a white shirt, a, a white, uh, a white starch collared shirt. I just don't like that the way that expression is on you, and it creates a hostile work environment. Oh, I'd our... much rather you wear blue. I mean, so so are we talking about the government or the businesses? Because government does this, right? The government says, hey, you can't shout fire in a crowded movie theater. Government says, uh, government says, hey, you can't, uh, you're, you as the private citizen can't just own a nuclear weapon. Like, you can't just construct a nuke in your, in your garage and call it good. Like, government already does these things, right? So, like, if we're talking about a business, right? Um, yeah, can a business can a be can a business say, hey, look, like you can do whatever you want in your in your free time, but if you're going to work with us, you have to get with the program a bit. Yeah, they absolutely well, can, can, and they, that's, can that's they, normal. Can they make can they make that program just be arbitrarily like bullshit? For instance, like for example, there's this there was this uh there was there was this program like in order for a bit for customers um for customers and for uh, employees to get with the program of this particular California business at one point during the during the pandemic they says you need to show you need to show me proof that you're you need to be not vaccinated and or something like that now regardless of the fact that it's fundamentally unenforceable because everybody can just pose as not being vaccinated um i feel like we can just grant that you know throw that out the window a little bit but um what are, but what are we it, even talking about like do you uh, here's okay sorry Here's the direct link. Can can some um, can some can a business make the program whatever the fuck they want? Oh no, no. Like, can they can they do that? I don't think they can make the. No. Sure. I, like so. Okay. So let me let me reskin the question, and this is going to be my last attempt to try to get like a salvageable answer here because I'm not saying it. Let's say that let's say that there is a reasonable standard here to apply for if you should or should not be able to bring a firearm onto the workplace. Let's say that um, that's there. That's that's one thing, right? So then we have to we have to jump from this reasonable to okay. So I get to carry a firearm however I please at the workplace, or I, I get this one protected form of firearm carry at the workplace. So like I just like because the the prop. Hey, look, I don't think that I think that we should change the law to allow licensed concealed carry permit holders to carry in the workplace is. Uh, without without that impacting the uh, the business's insurance rates, uh, without that uh, causing the termination of those employees who are practicing this particular protected right, et cetera, because why these people are vetted, um, these people are trained, uh, it's concealed, uh, they can have confidentiality uh, requirements and things like that so that people don't know that they're carrying at the workplace, we could do other things. Um, you know, like, so like in this hyper-specific circumstance, uh, these people carrying at work is not just legally okay, but it is protected by company policy so long as they're not pointing their gun at someone and waving it around or uh, revealing it to someone or something like that, you know. But that's a different prop than what we're talking about. Like, what we're talking about is businesses not being able to discriminate um, at all pertaining to this note, right? And, and so, like, we still haven't addressed, like, is there any reasonable level of discrimination at all given these practical concerns? Like that's the gap that we need to bridge. Okay. And it seems to any... me that there is. So uh, this this is just, that's my last question. And then I'd say, let's move gotcha. to closing statements after your response. Sure. Um, can I get you to rephrase the question one last time? Like, Yeah. So, so, so what, what is the connection between this, like this kind of like reasonable notion you have with um, the social contract stuff with, uh, this reasonable, um, like, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to just salvage this right now. So like the reasonable connection from you can't do something unreasonable in the social contract sense, uh, all the way through to there is, uh, I, I must be allowed to carry either, uh, you know, openly and concealed in the workplace without discrimination. Okay. So you want the connection so like, between you have, you have this right. I, I want to understand. I, I want to understand why it is objectively reasonable to to be able to carry in the workplace, regardless of context. Just period. Why is it, why it is reasonable for you to carry in the workplace? Period. Huh. Well, probably need to write these prompts a little better, but I'll play. I'll play. So it is. Um, I would say it is reasonable for you to be able to carry. Um, it is reasonable for you to be carry to carry in all these contexts. Period. Because, um, because the whenever you're carrying a firearm, when um, whenever you're carrying a firearm, it's 
I would say it's an evolution. Um, like, can we're going to grant a couple things. So then we're going to go through a couple of premises, right? Uh, you know, premise one. I would say that technically speaking, you're always armed. You have uh, um because you can use anything and everything as a weapon. Your fists are um, your fists are a weapon. Your feet are a weapon. Whatsoever. You're always armed in some manner, way, shape, or form. Are you wearing a shirt? Shirt's a weapon. Whatever. Right. Two. Um, it's a, it's necessarily the case that um, that all moral agents functionally have a right to self-defense. Um, this is not exclusive. This is inclusive. I say this inclusively. So it's functionally the case that um, that all moral agents have the right to self-defense. Um, uh, as and as a result, it's re it's pretty much impossible for you to be able to say you don't have a right to self-defense. Be, um, the reason why the reason why he's saying this would be impossible is because um, dur- in what way, shape, form, or way can you actually enforce it? If you can't enforce that, then you don't really have a reasonable basis in saying that you don't. And you can't because you're always armed, because you always have your fists and your feet. Right? So then as a result, then it's unreasonable. It's, unre- un- it's unreasonable for a business to go ahead and... Uh, it's unreasonable for a business to go ahead and say that you cannot that you cannot participate in something that you're naturally always doing in my in in my in in my analysis that's like saying a business can say that you're not allowed to breathe like this is this one spongebob episode from mr krabs you're functionally always armed and firearms and firearms are an arm there isn't a way we can selectively enforce what kind of arms you can carry uh so that uh, without being extremely arbitrary as a result, then, there is no situation where a business is allowed um, to reasonably say you cannot carry a weapon on the premises. And this involves all weapons, knives, bombs, uh, nukes, whatever, um, in order to go ahead and go with the prompt. I would I'd rather the more restrictive version that you mentioned earlier, and I'll probably write that next time. I'll take more care in writing that. But, yeah, that, that's, that's my response. You're always armed. They can't take it away from you. That's bullshit. Do they ask you to do cut off your arms? Um, Are they going to enforce on different guns, different arms? So sure. arbitrary. Um, I guess um, I'm willing to wave and, and give you the last word in the debate here. Um, if you want to move into closing statements, I can start or you can start. I'll give you the choice. Uh, uh, what was the format you're supposed to have the last word? Um, well, yeah, normally, normally if I, if I don't go first, then I'll go last, but I, I, I feel comfortable going first, um, cause I have some thoughts just off the top right now. So if you want to take the last uh, word, you can. Uh, well, fucking, I don't really have much else to say, so go with whatever feels most comfortable to you. If you want to say something, give a response and then we go into closing statements. I don't know how you want to do this. Um, I I'm just, really much yeah, I'm just, uh, this is the, this is going to be my last words for the debate here. And then if you, yeah. if you, uh, want to give your last words after this, then we're going to go and then Stone can come back for a vote. Um, yeah, so then closing statements then. Yeah. So, so. In all of this, I don't see on my end um, an argument for the proposition, really. The the closest that we get to an argument for the proposition at hand is that um, you need some kind of, uh, you, you obviously are armed in some way at any point in your life. And because of that, uh, you know, the business can't disarm you at all. That would be unethical. Um, to me, this just misses the mark entirely for several reasons. One of the reasons is, hey, look, the business is, we're not talking about the business cutting off your arms or feet. Uh, Obviously, this is unethical. We're talking about whether or not you can bring a particular weapon into the office. We can reductio this and go to more extreme examples of weapons. Hey, do I get to open carry an AR-15 into my office just whenever I feel like it? What about a nuclear weapon? Can I bring uh, can I bring a dirty bomb into the office? Uh, what about uh, uh, smallpox or anthrax? Can I bring that into an office? It seems like our answer to that is, hmm, a workplace has its reasons to say, no, you can't bring some weapons into the office. It seems like there is a line somewhere here uh, between uh, not cutting off your, your hands and feet or uh, gouging out your nails or whatever, uh, all the way up to, you know, bioweapons. There's there's somewhere in here there's a line that we've crossed, and that seems obvious enough. But saying that just because you can do something, therefore you have a right to it, seems to always be what we come back to no matter what we do. And this is just trying to get an aught from an is. We can reskin any of these rights 
has ethical obligations that someone else has, in this case, the business or the government's ability to control what you do or their obligation to protect your freedom is there simply because you have it. Um, that's not really telling me anything. Like, because it is the case that you're physically capable of doing something doesn't mean that you should do it uh, or that you're obligated to that particular physical capability being protected. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, finally, there's not really a response here uh, to the uh, to that kind of point here where either the proposition is vacuous or it's incorrect. Um, and uh, again, like either either regulating this behavior um, as that business owner or as that business leader, either you're infringing on their rights or you're not. If firing, trespassing, kicking that person out of your business is not an infringement, then we're not really talking about anything here with this prop, keeping in spirit with the prop. So the only other option is that it must be an infringement uh, if you restrict in particular like firearms from being carried in the workplace. But now if you do that, you get to the business is uh, if the business is not able to do that, then you're infringing on the business's rights to control their own property. And that's the basis that the Second Amendment is uh, based in. That's the contextual basis of uh, quite a bit of our Constitution and property rights. Um, and a good example of that's the Fourth Amendment. Um, another example of that is actually the Third Amendment with uh, uh, not being able to have troops quarter on your uh, on your property. Um, so so there's a lot of issues here. The more practical solution, the more simple solution, when we get past the red herrings, when we get past the irrelevant aspects of this, and when we actually need to deliver the goods, really the bottom line is, hey, look, does a business have the right to control what happens um, on their grounds to some degree? The answer is yes. Uh, does a business have the have the, the ability and the right to uh, keep things productive, work focused and safe uh, in their opinion with their practices? Yes. Does the employee have the ability to consent to these things? The answer is yes. So if the employee can't get with the program, they can find a business where, hey, you can go ahead and carry a weapon within that business. Otherwise, yeah, weapons don't uh, need to be uh, these these additional weapons. Firearms don't need to be present literally everywhere. It's OK that they have a certain box and a certain need that's very important that they fulfill in our lives. But we don't need to sit there and uh, bring them literally everywhere with us all of the time. Uh, and and it's not an infringement uh, of my rights if you don't want me to bring a gun into into your house. That's your right as the owner uh, to say, hey, look, as a condition of entry, uh, I'm not allowing X, Y, Z into my property. Um, that's perfectly normal and reasonable. So that's that's it for my closing statement. If you agree with me, if you agree that there's some standard here uh, where businesses can say, no, you can't bring this into my property, uh, then go ahead and vote for me. And if you disagree with that, I'm happy to say, go ahead and vote with my opponent. That's it. Uh, right. Uh, oh, like uh, Stone, is, is there anything, are we finished here or did I miss something? Oh, well, I took it um, you were doing closing statements, and Walt just finished his, so if you wanted to oh, give any, okay. you could. Oh, okay, gotcha, 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 thanks. Um, so, um, I think I, I think it's very important to say that um, that despite that despite a um, despite what my opponent has said, um, if, um, if nothing else, if nothing else, um, whether or not I have or have not succeeded in um, in convincing you, I think there, I think there is supposed to be something said about the about the certain limits that businesses and sometimes even private individuals have regarding how they should uh, how they should and should not govern um, their own personal lives and properties and whatnot um, regarding your personal rights. Right? Um, I, I think then in this case that. Um, if at the very, if at the very least, it is, um, it is possible that within my opponent and, and within all of you that I have opened up a certain dialogue about to what end can a business, um, can a business uh, skirt around and tell you how you can practice these rights. I, um, I will think, um, I will think that in some way that is a, that is a, uh, um, that is a good thing. That is an ethical thing that I have done to allow you to consider these um, certain aspects. Uh, nominally, uh, nominally though, I do, um, I do think that, uh, there is a, there is a fallacy of extremes that, um, that can happen, um, when we aren't precise with language. 
Um, and uh, I don't I don't think this is necessarily like how it's supposed to be done, but um, uh, I I do find I do find myself thinking that in in some measures, ways, shapes, and forms, um, definitely less so than my opponent. There needs to be some kind of uh, affirmation of affirmation of some kind of limitation, um, like a sort of line that allows for a functional and sufficient medium of your personal rights and their personal rights. Um, so. Um, with that being said, um, uh, I would I would say that at the end of the day, if I would have to cast my vote, it would probably be towards it would probably be towards uh, towards Walt because uh, such a condition such a condition in all cases is uh, not tenable. It seems um, in that uh, I personally wouldn't if if I was in, if I was trying to go to an anti gunner's house I definitely wouldn't force myself to carry a gun on to carry a gun on me and go into it anyway that would seem pretty dickish so that's um uh that's what I've got and uh, I guess you can interpret that as a concession but we're already done here so do with that as you will would you would you like to put it to a vote or would you like to concede it's up to you uh we'll we'll put it to a vote we're we're okay. we're already so far in sure. as well just finish the whole thing